that Peter had a gospel to the Jews, Paul had a gospel to the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 2 verse 7. Um, it does indeed seem to say that. Uh, so this is from the King James. Um, the New King James and other translations don't seem to support their idea as much as the King James. So I'll, I'll use the King James. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And it continues there. Uh, so their conclusion is that it's telling us clearly that there's two different Gospels. One Gospel given by God to the Jews and one Gospel given by God, a different Gospel given specifically for the Gentiles. And the Jews later apparently come in to the one which is for Gentiles. Um, and that apparently happens in Acts chapter 15. We'll be looking at that in another section soon. So just going through this, I'll show you two possible interpretations and, and you'll see that one makes sense and the other one makes no sense at all. But before we get to the two interpretations, we'll just skim through and see what the context is telling us. Uh, so 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, well, just going back further, in chapter 1, Paul starts off more or less saying you guys have departed into a different gospel than the one I delivered to you since I was there some other people have come and have perverted the gospel you've obviously taken more confidence in them than you have in me and so Paul is looking to redeem his reputation he's looking to bring them back into confidence in himself and in what he had taught to them more so in what he had taught to them but in order to get them to be confident in what he had taught to them, he needed to get them confident in um, himself. So he's redeeming his reputation to bring them back to what he had taught them. Um, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Uh, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So he's saying here, when I came up, um, I taught that gospel, and no one was uh, teaching this false doctrine that you've since accepted. No one was teaching that you have to be circumcised to be saved through Christ, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty. Liberty from what? Liberty from a need to keep the Mosaic law and to be Jewish and to respect the Jewish authorities, to go to the temple. Liberty from Judaism, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. Bondage to Judaism, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, no. So to whom we did not give place by subjection, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. What truth? The truth that you don't need to be circumcised to be saved. But of these, who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrawise, that is, but to the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he who wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, that is the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. So the two interpretations would be, when they saw that Paul had a gospel from God for the Gentiles and Peter had the other gospel, the one for the Jews, they approved of Paul. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would them having different gospels give them reason to believe in Paul? 
But contrary to the idea that they added to Paul, when they saw that Paul and Peter's gospel agreed, they approved of and teamed up with Paul. I think that makes much more sense. So to summarise it further, the interpretations would be, but contrary to the idea that they added to Paul, they approved of Paul because he had a different gospel to Peter. Again, that makes no sense. But contrary to the idea that they added to Paul, they approved of Paul because he had the same gospel as Peter. So the first interpretation, which is the one that dispensationalists hold to, makes no sense. Now keep in mind, not all dispensationalists try and use it in this way. Others will admit that it's not evidence of a second gospel. Um, the second interpretation makes perfect sense. So you'll notice also that there's no mention of any difference in the supposed two Gospels. There's no mention of the two Gospels um, outside of that verse. In fact, the next verse seems to give reason to believe against the idea that there were two Gospels because it says, He that wrought effectually in Peter to the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. So was the Holy Spirit teaching two different Gospels? I don't think so. Okay, so while I'm here, I, I figured I'd go through this um, Galatians chapter 2 verse 21. So as we trace the message down here, we see that it's still about how you don't need to be a Jew to be saved. We saw up here that it says they were at liberty from being circumcised. They they refused to be brought into bondage to Judaism, knowing that the truth was that in Christ you don't need to be a Jew to be saved. So it continues down here, but Peter, um, Paul withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. What was he to be blamed for? Well, before um, these Jews came, he did break the Mosaic law by eating with Gentiles. But when they came... He withdrew and separated himself and started keeping the Mosaic law again as if you have to keep the Mosaic law to be saved, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their um, dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what truth is that? that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, that you don't have to be a Jew. So when they failed to acknowledge that you don't have to keep the Mosaic law to be saved, I said to Peter, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So it's clear that the passage is talking about how you don't need to be a Jew to be saved. And it continues uh, talking about um, how you, you're not justified by the works of the law. It's talking about Jewish law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And the faith of Jesus Christ includes a law. It includes works of a law. But people come to this passage and they don't understand what it's talking about. And they get drawn into a doctrine of lawlessness. We, that is the Jews, have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So what's he saying? He's saying that we Jews don't have to keep the Mosaic law anymore because we're not saved through that. We're saved through the faith of Christ, which includes commandments. It's not talking about whether you have to obey as opposed to um, faith alone. Is talking about Judaism versus Christianity. Well, more specifically, is talking about Judaism plus Christianity or Judaism being separate from Christianity. It's, talk, it's comparing the idea of whether you have to be a Jew and a Christian to be saved or whether you just have to be a Christian to be saved. Continues, and then it says, I, a Christian through the law, am dead to the law. And then this last verse down here, this is the one I'm interested in. 
I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You will see faith alone Christians everywhere pointing to this verse as if it is some kind of evidence that Christ died in vain if we have to obey. Well, let's investigate that. Let's put it to the test. Faith alone doctrine uses verse 21 as evidence against a need to obey. So the question is, is it saying, if we need to obey Christ to remain saved, then Christ died in vain? Or is it saying, if Judaism is the covenant which saves, then Christ died in vain? Okay, so the first interpretation makes no sense. And we'll see that. And the second interpretation makes perfect sense. So, investigating the first interpretation, if we need to obey Christ to remain saved, his death was not in vain because his blood atones for their past sin and future accidental sin. So his death does not serve no purpose. It serves a purpose if we have to obey. Uh, but his sin does not atone for future willful sin. We see that in Hebrews 10.26. It says, If we sin willfully after having received a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. So if we sin willfully... Um, so looking at the second one, if Judaism is the covenant which makes a person a child of God, as many of the Jews thought, then Christ did not need to die. You see, so that makes perfect sense. So the first interpretation makes no sense. The second interpretation makes perfect sense. Therefore, anyone that is using that passage to teach that you don't have to obey to remain saved through Christ is teaching a doctrine which makes no sense. Because the need to obey Christ to remain saved does not mean that he died in vain. Okay, so it's just failure after failure after failure after failure for these guys. They have all of this red-hot evidence to support the idea that there's two Gospels and that you don't have to obey. And not only that, that if you think you have to obey, you go to hell for trusting in works. But all of it is just error. Okay? Um, if you believe that you have to obey to remain saved, you're probably already saved. And you've probably got a bit of a testimony of, of previously being an unrepentant sinner to now being one who walks in Christ's commandments the best you can. And you, you have a knowledge of um, Christ being a source of empowerment to walk on that narrow path of obedience. You know, we, uh, we can't expect non-Christians to achieve the obedience that we hope to achieve because we have the empowerment and they don't. They still have the power of sin on them. We're set free from the power of sin. We need to keep it that way and we need to wrestle against any power of sin that we see around us or in us and stay clean through prayer and fasting and, and doing the right thing. That's the wrestling match that a Christian is in. And um, also it's a wrestling match to be not deceived. Um, and that's why we're making this video. So, on to the next claim. 